like to think of a fishing rod as a long pole with a hook on one end and an idiot on the other. That's definitely the case with my fishing rod. I think that as humans, we are destined to a certain level of idiocy because we live in a complex world that's spectacular, dynamic, and ever-changing. There are libraries full of information in the air, the water, and the trees. The more we understand about our environment, the better equipped we are to live responsibly and respectfully in it, and ultimately, catch more fish. Wow. My name is Captain Quinn, and when I am outside doing what I love with the people I love, I am happy. I enjoy exploring, spinning yarns, and fishing. I'm a father, and when I'm not fishing, I'm also a husband. Five years ago, I set out on a journey to explore how much our happiness is connected to healthy environments. So I moved my family to northwestern BC, a place with wild rivers and rugged landscapes. My approach was simple. Venture deep into wild places, interact with people who are living lifestyles that honor their connection to the environment, and of course, chase wild salmon and steelhead with my fly rod. found was that the healthier our environment is, the happier we are able to be. Nice, son. <laughs> this is Cast Northwest. Hello, my name is Bob Patrick and I'm from the University of Saskatchewan. I teach there in the Department of Geography and Planning and my area of research and interest is drinking water and drinking water protection. While I was working as a land use planner in British Columbia at the Sunshine Coast Regional District in Seashelt, BC, I became aware that land use planning um, was not always beneficial to water sources. For example, residential development and road development, even some of the commercial developments that we were approving weren't really being done with water in mind. And so I came to realize that we were managing land and managing water very separately and that this wasn't beneficial for anyone really. Uh, dividing land and water and planning for them separately meant that uh, while you were working with land you weren't really thinking about the impacts on the water. So that's what drew me more and more in, with interest in, in water planning and watershed planning and taking a more holistic approach where we thought about the land and the water all at the same time. And that's where my work in source water protection, I think, has great relevance for the protection of water and water quality, water quantity, but also the better management of land and more responsible use of land. Because whatever we do on the land will ultimately reflect uh, in terms of water quality or reflect in water quantity. The, 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 the take home message is that well, it's incredible. Yeah, it's awesome. We need it. it. It it's inspiring. It needs to be respected. It needs to be treated with respect. And uh, this is this is a source of of life for for so many organisms, and and it's part of the ecosystem. This is we are looking at an ecosystem right now, and the land and the water interact, have an intimate relationship, and humans are here to just be part of that but to, to be here in a, very, uh, in a very gentle way and not to disturb that balance between land and water. Okay, well, as a species, hopefully we can learn from our mistakes sure. and, and, and redevelop our relationship with water. That's right. Thank you so much, Okay, Bob. you're welcome, I'll, Quinn. I'll go buy Catherine a, Quinn. I'll go buy a cup of water. Okay. A carbonated kind. Carbonated, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was funny. That was good. <laughs> Thank you.
My name is Cedar Welsh and I live in Terrace, BC. I'm a dendrohydrologist using tree rings to investigate historic stream flow and climate relationships in Northwest BC. I came to Terrace um, in 2007. I did my master's at the University of Northern British Columbia and my field study area was um, in the Kispiox Valley. And so I got introduced to the area through that research and I've been here and working in Terrace ever since. What I really like about being in Terrace is you can basically hike um, not too far out of town, drive down a dirt road and find a pretty um, secluded area for yourself to, and your dogs to go for a hike and walking around. It's, it's a pretty spectacular place to live. Hey Cedar. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> good, good to good. see you. Nice to see ya. So thanks so much for uh, uh, agreeing to show me some of the research that you're doing with your, uh, your project. You are in a way mapping out sort of the history of, of the Skeena watershed and a couple other watersheds? Yeah, I'm, it, that's a good way of putting it. I'm basically trying to de develop multi-century long records of stream flow for the Skeena Nass and Stikine watersheds. Wicked. Yeah. So how old are some of these trees? Like what, we're looking at hundreds of years? Yeah, so um, my oldest site I would say is around 450 years old, which really isn't old in the grand scheme of things, but it's, it's, it's what we've got and um, it's a great um, addition to um, an area that has only 50 years at most instrumental data on stream flow. So this is going to extend those records back, hopefully, uh, to as old as these trees are. So about 400 years we'll get a, we'll get a record of stream flow for. That is so cool. So this is uh, one of the tools that we use. This is the tool, the tool. That the we, singular tool. Yeah, the tool. This is a very important tool for dendrochronologists. Yeah. And this is how we're going to basically put it into the tree. So you want it to be 90 degree angle um, from the stem of the tree. So, and you want to get it on a slope, you want to get onto the side. So you're actually in the right spot. Okay. Somewhere DBH, diameter at breast height, which is a lot higher on me than most people. So this is called the spoon, the and this spoon. is what extracts the core from the increment borer. So you're going to just stick it in here, and then here comes the core. Whoa, that is cool. It's okay. so, those are can very. I touch it? Can, yeah, can, do you do you see how wide those rings are compared to the ones you saw in the lab? Yeah. So this is a this isn't uh, that's a big growth year right there. <laughs> They're all big growth years. <laughs> so how, this tree is what? I would say it's probably around 30 years old. 30 or, years old. Or 40. This is probably about the size of the trees I find that are 400 years old up in the higher elevations. Really? So, yeah, yeah. Just super tight growth rings. Very tight, yeah. Um, I've heard that you can eat the cambium layer in the spring. Yeah, and spruce in particular. Too. In they, spruce? Yeah. Have you ever tried it? No. How but do you I'm find sure. it? I, Is that I'm it? I'm sure it's... Did I just have it? You, uh, did you That's get the bitter. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, that... No, now you have the cambium. Now I have the cambium. You just ate the bark, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Very sprucey. You could totally... And then it gets woodier. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah, yeah. Isn't it crazy, like, the amount of, like, food that you can get out of a forest? Oh, yeah. I think of it like... A, a, a library of information contained in each of those growth rings. What we know from the past determines what we know for a future. So basically having a lo as long of a baseline information as we can, we can learn from that. Um, and, and that's going to be really important for any kind of planning for the future. How is our human water supply going to change in the future? Um, uh, how is stream ecology affected by um, climate change and, and also how is the survival of our salmon responding to these changes as well. Those trees older than me. Oh yeah, much older. Wiser. That's when you were born. More intelligent. 
So climate change is real. It's real. It's real. It's real in northern BC. Leo said it in his acceptance <laughs> speech, and this proves it. Yes. Right here. <laughs> that yeah. climate change is real. <laughs> yeah. So what do we do about it? What can we do? Yeah, well, uh, well, this information will help us decide what we need to do. I guess the only thing that we can do is to augment some of our um, choices we make on a daily basis. You know, start small. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't really give you a hocus, a magic answer. Yeah, but I, I think part of it is just having this conversation. We know there's tons of things that we can do. Yeah, there is. Like, yeah. come on yeah. now, people. Yeah. There's lots that you can do. Yeah, there are. Um, so it's just a matter of doing it. Mm -hmm. But then also encouraging these new innovative alternatives mm -hmm. to, to some of the, 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 the sources of the problem. For sure. Fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, but we won't go down that road. That's 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 a huge, long, windy we'll road. We'll be sitting on this log for years. <laughs> well, I'll be older than the tree we just cored <laughs> by the time we finish. <laughs> I'm uh, Ian Riemann Schneider. I manage a salmon hatchery in Terrace, BC. I've been fishing for as long as I can remember. Uh, even you know, back in, in, in grade three or four, I was known as, as the fish kid in class. I think it's pretty safe to say that my life revolves around fish. My dad started his career as a fisheries technician so ever since I was about the age of six, uh, I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. I knew that I was going to be a fish tech. For me, a perfect day fishing um, would be one with nobody else around. There has been fish in this system weighed in at over 100 pounds. Yeah. That's a massive fish. At work, you're dealing with fish 24-7, and when you're not working, you are hitting the waters fishing as a passion, something that you've been doing since you were just a little boy in diapers, or you don't still wear diapers, I'm assuming, but you plan on having children one day? Probably, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to take them fishing? You want to have all these opportunities available for them? Mm -hmm. Is your son going to manage the hatchery one day? Who knows? You could say that you already have thousands and thousands and thousands of children in here right now. That's correct, yes. Can, you sh can we go have a look at them? Mm -hmm. Have you named most of them? Yeah. Are you excited? Nervous? So this is the heath room. <clears throat> These are your children. When we bring in the uh, when we bring in the eggs and melt right from the river, we come in and uh, we do a uh, we get a volume on them and an egg count so that we have an idea how many eggs there are per per fish. And we bring them in here and they incubate. If you have a look, you can see that they're eyed up now. How what many about? are in there? 4,056. 4,056. You gotta get that big book of baby names safe. These eggs will incubate, they'll hatch, they'll stay in here till about February when we bring them into the troughs and they grow in there until we tag them and clip them in May and let them go in uh, the first week of June. The survival rate is higher for the smolts, right? Because they're much larger. Yeah. So that the fry will stay in the river in freshwater for an extra year still, whereas the smolts, most of them are just going to go 
straight down to the estuary and the ocean. And in the, so in that younger phase, they're more vulnerable to predators yeah, and yeah. disease and stuff. And that's where our tagging um, information comes into play because we can see whether or not the fish that are surviving, whether or not they're small or fry, right? Because we'll get that information from the number in the tag. Ah. So we will be able to find out if there's uh, you know something going on in fresh water or if there's, you know, if there's a marine survival. Ocean survival. Yeah. Uh, I used to set traps like this up for birds in my front yard. Mm. I put bread in there. <laughs> yeah. Is that what this is? I used to do that for squirrels. Squirrel? Did you ever get one? Yeah. You did? Mm -hmm. I never caught a single bird. <laughs> right. We're trying to, you know, pick up as much data as we can through this project so that we, you know, we can get an idea to better manage fishery. Um, answer some questions. Answer some questions. That's right. Like what came first? The fish or the egg? Mm -hmm. Chart says egg. You have a very thorough understanding of, of what it takes and, and everything that goes into raising 260,000 Chinook every year and then, and then using that to contribute to the, the science that goes into managing this, this fishery here on the west coast of BC and, and, and the US up in Alaska. Um, my question now that I'm wondering is, are you any good at catching fish yourself? Well, I do believe I have outfished you before. Never been, never, ever. <laughs> Maybe once. Maybe once when I forgot my rod at home. You want to uh, hit the water and go see if there's any winter steelhead kicking around? Let's do it. Surrounded by these incredible trees, the snow lightly kissing the branches of the evergreens, and a big deep breath of fresh mountain air. That's what it's all about. Decent company. Hogging all the good water. See that fish jump? You know he's saying himself right now? Row up, Captain Quinn!
this is a true, true, true winter run fish. Look at the <laughs> Look at that fish. <laughs> That's what I was This is what I was waiting for. This thing. So this This is basically why I moved across the country. This and this. <laughs> Me and this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Go make lots of babies, please. Lots and lots of babies. How satisfied do you feel right now? Well, I just want to sit for a minute. <laughs> just be quiet and just sit here. In other words, just you want me to it stop eating? <laughs> I just want to take it all in. Reflect. Yeah. Let's reflect. I think that it is fair to say that we may never fully understand the complexities of our environment. But after spending time with Bob, Cedar, and Ian, it is clear to me that we can always work to broaden our knowledge of these complex ecosystems, and in doing so, be better prepared to live together respectfully and responsibly. Mm -hmm.